uh, in this particular image, uh, the inset shows to the lower left the plume. It was about 10 to 12 kilometers across at this point. This camera, we uh, weren't very hopeful of, of, of actually seeing the ejected cloud, so we were quite pleased that we saw it. It was a, a, a nice, large uh, plume that came up. Uh, in the next slide, it shows the approximate field of view of the instruments that I'm going to talk about that did this water detection I just described. The red circle there shows a one degree field of view uh, at just shortly after impact for our instruments. And what's important about this is that that uh, field of view, that red circle is almost completely filled with ejecta cloud. That's important because that is uh, filling the instruments with the signal, with the light, the, the, you know, the, the information we needed to understand what was in the ejecta cloud. So it worked really well. We picked the time, the field of view, and everything else like we had hoped, and it worked. And we, we actually filled the instrument with signal, which was really important. Uh, the next slide shows uh, some, uh, some of my favorite bits of uh, data from the mission. At the very end, we turned one of our near-infrared cameras to a long exposure. And as we settled down, settled, screamed down into Cabeus, uh, dipped below the bright rims, what we saw was uh, a, a floor Cabeus revealed for the first time uh, in one or two billion years. We have not seen the floor of Cabeus ever, of course. It's in permanent shadow. But these near-infrared cameras were able to image light that was radiating from the walls, scattering in from uh, the rims of the craters and whatnot, and revealed what you see here. And eventually, what we could see, both in our thermal cameras, we could pick up the, the heat from the impact, and also this image, we could register them together. We could see the crater, the brand new fresh crater the Centaur had just made in this field of view. The arrows pointing to it. What you see here are those bright hills. Those are nice sloping hills uh, with pocketed with smaller craters, some larger craters here. The scale on this, this, this image is a, is a couple kilometers across or so. It's about from 10 kilometers above the surface when we took this image. And you can see our crater down there with the arrow pointed. And the next image uh, shows that crater zoomed in inset. We hit into a nice level flat plane which is exactly what we wanted. It is one of the coldest places in Cabeus. Uh, the Diviner instrument saw our impact crater as well on the LRO spacecraft and measured the temperature in the region where we impacted at about uh, minus 230 degrees, 220 degrees below, Celsius, below zero Celsius, so very, very cold. And you can see in that inset, the crater we made, the dark area in the center is the crater. The brighter area is ejecta that has been spilled out across it, uh, the crater we made was 20 to uh, 30 meters across, and the ejecta, the bright area there, is approximately uh, 60 to 80 meters. We have uh, information that indicates that the ejecta blanket actually went much broader, out uh, to several hundred meters outwards, um, really affecting the, the area. We, this is a nice, large crater. What we expected in the 20 to 30 meter class uh, means we hit in relatively unconsolidated, weak material. Um, and, uh, and that's what resulted in the ejecta plume that you saw in the previous slide. So what did we see from the instruments that detected water? And that's what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, next slide uh, shows the two instruments that I'm going to describe uh, in detail to you. Uh, the instruments uh, that we're going to talk about are spectrometers. The spectrometers measure colors of wavelengths. Uh, and, and those colors are affected by various compositions from various compounds, for example, water, or, or carbon dioxide or, or whatever, they, each, each compound will affect those lights differently. We have two instruments that we, we used on, on this mission to look at that plume. An ultraviolet invisible spectrometer, uh, the one indicated there on the lower left, and uh, near-infrared spectrometers. We had two near-infrared spectrometers, one looking down and one looking to the side at the sun. Today I'm just going to talk about the two that we're looking down, because those are uh, the two we focused on to, to provide the results I'm describing today. Uh, the next slide then shows uh, some of the near-infrared spectrometer results. Uh, un unfortunately, spectrometers often just give squiggly lines, not pretty pictures. However, these squiggly lines are really important because they are, as I mentioned, the, the change in these colors and the changes in those lines really tell us what we're seeing uh, in that cloud. What I have here is a, a plot of brightness against color or wavelength. And the black line with the little hash marks, the vertical hash marks, is the data, the observation. This is an average of about 20 to 60 seconds after impact. We've averaged a number of 
uh, instrument scans together. The black vertical hash marks are, are uncertainty bars, or error bars in the measurement. What, why I show those is to show that these measurements, these dips you see in the line are real. They're not uh, just noise, they're very real. And uh, what you would see, what you would expect to see if, if you're just looking at bright, colorless, gray dust of ejecta is shown on the next slide. This red line shows a continuum, a black body, what we call black body continuum, something hot. If this is warm dust coming up at about, say, 400 or, or 500 degrees Celsius, you'd see this nice red smooth line all the way across like you see here. That's not what the data sees. The data has, it kind of comes up and meets that line, but then it has all these notches taken out of it. And that, each of those notches is a compound, some kind of material absorbing infrared light, near-infrared light. So the first thing we did was, well, let's put in some water and see what happens when you put water into that model, that red line. And the next slide shows that. And we get a good fit in two regions. Uh, the two regions are indicated by the yellow. Those are the water bands, water vapor and ice bands. There's actually a third to the left that I don't show here at about 1.27 microns, shorter wavelengths to the left. That actually shows this as well. We got good fits. This was a unique fit, meaning we could not put other compounds in here and generate this same fit. So we were really excited. It was a pretty uh, uh, tight fit within the air bars for, for water vapor and ice. The, uh, um, now, all those other bands and bumps there are of interest, too. And, and we've been studying those. And I don't want to say too much beyond uh, what I've already said on those bumps and wiggles, except the next slide shows that we can actually fit them all pretty well with a variety of different compounds. And that's when I said this goes beyond the water. It really does. There's a lot of stuff that came out of there. And you're going to hear about this a little bit more as we discuss this on the panel. But uh, there was uh, a lot of stuff that came up out of the floor of Cabeas, not just water that we saw. So the next slide then I, uh, goes on to the next instrument. Uh, if we can have the next slide. This uh, is the ultraviolet visible spectrometer. And what's really important to consider today as, as I come forward with these findings is we see evidence for the water in two instruments, two independent instruments looking at water two completely independent ways. And that's what really made us confident in our, in our findings right now. This shows the, the uh, radiance or the brightness, the measured by the ultraviolet visible spectrometer. Again, it's measuring the brightness as a function of color. And that's uh, color or wavelength is shown across the bottom axis here. The red line shows uh, uh, the measurement. So it's a little bit brighter towards the right at, at red wavelengths. 660 nanometers are red wavelengths. What you see, though, that's important are some little spikes. Those little spikes are called emission lines. Emission lines are, are diagnostic of, of a, a variety of different compounds. So, uh, and they result from when a compound, either a molecule or an atom, is in an excited state and relaxing out of that excited, high, higher energy state. It releases some of the energy in the form of light and creates a sharp spike, an emission line. You can kind of think of it like a neon sign. A neon sign that's glowing red or green has a particular gas in it, gets excited, energized with electricity, and as those atoms uh, in that neon bulb relax, they emit light of a particular color. That's what we're seeing here is species are emitting light at a particular cover, color. And by understanding exactly what color that, that emission line is at, you understand what species is emitting it. So what we were interested in is uh, some emission lines in the ultraviolet. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, we can talk about those emission lines. Uh, the emission line we were interested in comes from the, the uh, hydroxyl molecule, OH. OH uh, can be produced when water vapor, H2O, is broken up by, by sunlight. Ultraviolet sun rays will break up a water molecule into OH and H. And that OH is energized. It's, it's excited. And as it relaxes from an energized state, it releases some light, an emission line, rate, uh, a series of emission lines even between 306 and about 310 nanometers in the ultraviolet. And that's the range we're looking at here. So what this figure shows is the ratio. What we've done is we've divided pre- and post-impact measurements to get rid of everything else we're not really interested in. We're just interested in stuff resulting from the impact and, and plotted it as a function of, a co of color again here or wavelength. And right in the middle where that blue color is, you see a